Alexander Stubb, welcome to In Conversation. Thanks, pleasure to be with you. Is Finland's joining NATO a threat to Russia, as President Vladimir Putin says? No, not at all. Remember that Vladimir Putin sees a lot of threats around nowadays. Uh, I think uh, it's actually going to increase security in the Baltic Sea region. So basically, uh, it is not against anyone, it is for ourselves. And obviously, when you have an aggressive imperialist country like Russia attacking uh, an independent state like Ukraine, if you have 1,340 kilometers border with Russia, you do everything in your power to secure your own border. For us, that's right now NATO membership. Why not stay neutral, though? You were neutral previously. Well, we were neutral during the Cold War, but not after the Cold War. That's when we joined the European Union and forged a very close partnership uh, with NATO. So in my mind, it's quite simple. Uh, there are basic sets of values which have to do with liberal democracy, um, freedom, human rights, fundamental rights, and protecting minorities. Our football club is the European Union and NATO, which hold those values. Russia does not. We need to seek protection. What about commentators who are critical, Russian commentators, who say that Ukraine, Sweden and Finland are merely puppets of US ambitions in Europe? <laughs> well, what do you think I say as a Finn? Remember that we fought two wars with the Russians. One was a proxy war uh, during our independence, 1917, 1918. And the other one was two wars during uh, World War II. One was the Winter War and the other was the War of Continuation. Then during the Cold War, we basically achieved a careful balance between the East and the West. But when the Soviet Union collapsed, we chose our uh, football team. It's not about being a puppet to the United States. It's, have, it's about having a certain value set, believing in that and doing everything that you can in order to protect you. Remember that Russia thinks in big power, imperialist terms. Uh, they are willing to annex Ukraine. They might attack Finland. Therefore, we protect ourselves. No way in which we can stay neutral in this kind of situation. It's a question of both principles and practice. What about those who say this wouldn't have happened if Ukraine had not signaled that it wanted to join NATO? Do you think that Russia wouldn't have invaded if Ukraine had not signaled that? I fundamentally disagree with that thesis. And let me give you uh, two reasons. The first one is this war had nothing to do with Ukrainian NATO or EU membership. It was all about European values. Putin wants to create what he calls a Ruski Mir, basically making Russia great again, which for him means one language, Russian, one religion, Orthodox, and one leader himself. He wanted to fight against what he calls decadent Western values and didn't want to see Ukraine go down that path. So that's point number one. Point number two, you know what? The thing that would not have happened was it not for uh, Putin's and Russia's aggression was Finnish NATO membership and Swedish NATO membership. So as someone who's always advocated Finnish NATO membership, I should actually thank Putin for making it happen. It would never have happened without it. Well, yes, you're referring to the fact that previously, actually, Finns didn't think that they needed to join NATO. And now they overwhelmingly have voted uh, in all the polls, at least, that there have been uh, 80 percent, close on 80 percent now, say that they believe in NATO membership. Indeed. You know, before the war, the opinion polls were giving 50 against NATO membership and 20 in favor. The night after the war, sort of three days of polling, 53 in favor, 20 against, and now we're up to 80 percent. So it did change overnight. And I always say that, you know, Finns are actually very pragmatic. So when things on the ground change, say when we declared our independence after the Russian Revolution, it was a quick one. When World War II was about to end, we accepted a very uncomfortable peace with Stalin, but we did it. When the Cold War ended, we immediately joined the European Union. And now that Russia attacked uh, Ukraine, we decided, OK, let's go into NATO. So Finns are really good and pragmatic about this stuff. You're only 5.5 million people. You are, in fact, not much different in population from Singapore. Do you seriously think that you can stand up to the might of Russia with its 150 million persons and with a very, very big and capable army? 
Well, I mean, I, I think the example that which it's always difficult, you know, to and, and a little bit dangerous to, uh, you know, use examples from from the past. But of course, during World War II, we were able to stave off the Russians and uh, were able to maintain our independence. Uh, and you could say that the Ukrainian army, certainly when the war began, was much, much smaller, much weaker and poorly, much more poorly equipped than the Finnish army. Uh, so I, I have, you know, absolutely no qualms about, uh, you know, uh, our military. I, we're very strong on land uh, and in air. It's not about numbers. It's basically about the system and the material that you have. And we have one of the most sophisticated armies, I would argue, uh, in the world. probably going to have its joining of NATO approved within the next few weeks. What's going to happen? What is Russia going to do? Aren't you afraid? No, not at all. I mean, you know, we have expected and we have already seen hybrid or cyber attacks. So it's about, you know, uh, disinformation. It's about uh, perhaps attacking our critical infrastructure, which might have to do with communication or Home pages. We saw the attacks on the Nord Stream gas pipelines. But you have to understand that the Russian military actually right now is not only weak, uh, but it is not performing very well. So I think they have their hands full uh, on the front in Ukraine. And in that sense, we're not too worried uh, about our step into NATO. The good news here, of course, is that we've been preparing for NATO membership ever since the beginning of the 1990s. That's when our political leadership understood that it was not possible to join NATO, but let's make our system as NATO compatible as possible. So basically, you know, if you take the top five NATO compatible countries inside NATO, Finland would be one of them. Therefore, we're not afraid. So you're not expecting to see Russian troops going across your thousand kilometer border into Finland? No, that would be Russian disinformation. I mean, there's no point in them doing that. And of course, you know, remember how the not only strategy and tactic, but rhetoric of Putin has changed. First, it was a special operation. You know, it was against Ukraine. Uh, then ever since it's began to backtrack and narrow down. And I think actually Russia is going to lose the war in Ukraine and Ukraine is going to be able to push back the Russian troops. So the last thing that Putin wants uh, as a master tactician, but a failure in st strategy is to fight on two fronts. So don't, don't worry about it. You called Vladimir Putin, whom you've met, one of the most intelligent strategic leaders that you'd ever met. Do you still think that now? Probably not intelligent strategic. I've said that he's intelligent, he's well, well prepared, he's, he's charismatic. Uh, but I don't think he's good at strategy. What he's good is at tactique. So strategy, what, the strategy that he, sh he had was to make Ukraine Russian it became European. To split the European Union, never seen it more unified. To split the transatlantic partnership, back with a vengeance. To split NATO, back with a new purpose. And the strategy was to keep Finland and Sweden outside of NATO. So I don't think he has succeeded very well. Do you think that people are worried about the prospect of nuclear war though in Europe? Well, I think there's a, a lot of public discourse about it. Uh, I would actually be a little bit more careful because it is a serious conversation to have. I would still put uh, an escalation into nu a nuclear, full, fully blown nuclear war 
at under 1%. But you always have to prepare for this because, you know, Putin is very unpredictable. But Putin might be many things. He's not stupid, and nor is he suicidal. Uh, it would be stupid to use them because the rest of the world would turn against him. It is a taboo. You simply do not use uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, and secondly, you know, the retaliation, I think, from the West and especially from the United States, not only in terms of, well, especially in terms of conventional warfare, would be devastating to the Russian army. So therefore, I don't think he's going to do it. I remember that, you know, Putin used to have a few sort of trump cards. One was his military. Well, we can see that that's not working. The other one was his economy. Well, that is less than 2% of global GDP. And the third one was energy. And he's basically lost all three. So he has to think, you know, does he want to become a vassal state of, of China or what is his future? So he's going to have to be very careful in his, in his next moves. He might be very desperate, but remember that in Russia, the leaders rarely make mistakes, at least according to the public. I'm going to take you up on that idea about China as well. Commentators over here in Asia like to draw parallels, uh, and they say, well, you know, if we take parallels with China, small countries should not provoke their big neighbors. Do you agree? Well, you know, I'm not going to start giving any advice to uh, my Asian friends. Uh, I am writing a book about order in a new world disorder, and Asia, of course, plays a very big a role in that, including China, which is, of course, not only a regional superpower, but a global superpower. Um, I actually, you know, would argue and see probably China as a much more patient uh, and also less expansionist power uh, than Russia. Of course, now we'll have to see after uh, the uh, Chinese Communist Party uh, Congress, uh, Xi, Xi Jinping's uh, you know, next five years, 10 years, what, what the narrative of, of, of China is going to be. But I, I think the Asians are usually quite good at finding a comfortable balance of power without going into conflict. But aren't we moving into some kind of military blocks in which we have to align ourselves to one or the other? Uh, I think the world is less binary. I mean, a war situation is, of course, quite binary, uh, but the world is a little bit more gray than that. I think we are seeing a shift in the balance of power and the international norms of power and institutions that were pretty much created, I would argue, in the image of the West, both after World War II and after the Cold War. And now I would argue legitimately as well, uh, a lot of Asian countries and, and other places around the world are saying, listen, it's all well and good to have these norms and institutions, but we want to be represented as well. So I would be probably looking at that more than the creation of you know, military alliances around the world. And remember in today's world, you know, even though we are in a war in Ukraine right now, everything can be weaponized. So it's not only about military alliance because you, know, you can use energy, technology, information, even a currency uh, as a weapon. So in that sense, I think the situation is a lot more gray than black and white. What about people, which I've heard here in Asia, who say, this is a European problem. This is an exclusively almost European problem. You guys created it. You deal with it. Why should we in Asia care? Uh, it's an argument that I make as well. And I keep on saying that this is not actually only about uh, Russia and the West, but it's also about the West and the rest. And the rest is justified in asking the question, why do we have to pay the price of higher food, higher fertilizer, higher energy, and inf in inflation, and potentially a global economic downturn, this is your mess, deal with it. Uh, uh, and I, I, I buy that argument. Of course, I'm happy that 141 states first and now 144 in the UN voted against Russia, but I'm worried that 35 abstained because they are over half the world's population. This should be a wake up call, I think, for the West and get us to understand that you know, there is gonna be a shift in the balance of power uh, and we're gonna to have to have what I call a more dignified foreign policy.
what can we expect over the next few months? Is Ukraine going to be able to push Russia out of uh, its territory? And even if it did, that may not settle the issue at all. But how long is the world going to have to deal with the impact of this terrible conflict? Yeah, I think expect a few things. Number one, begin with the premise that this is going to last a long time. What is long time? Don't expect it to end, say, before uh, the summer next year. Secondly, uh, expect it to be unpredictable. We don't know what Putin is going to do. I mean, we just saw him mobilize his troops. It was a complete failure. 200,000 mobilized and 700,000 escaped the country. So we see that he's not going to be able to rely on his, his army. Uh, expect uh, the capacity of Ukraine to continue to push back Russia. But the unpredictability is that what is Russia going to do in that situation? Well, what they're doing right now uh, is attacking uh, civilian targets, which of course is atrocious, it's unfair, and it's a war crime. Uh, but we don't know. So my, my, my sort of uh, only, only hope, of course, is that this ends at some stage. And I hope that um, Ukraine will be able to push Russia back. I think the only solution that we have here is a military solution. If it's only a military solution, then it means it's going to be conflict and there are going to be people dying. Yes, that is the sad reality of the situation that we are in. And I've always said that the alternative cost of war is way too high. And I just wish that someone like Putin uh, and the cronies around him would understand that. He's killing innocent people as we speak by the thousands, day in, day out, week in, week out, month after month. There's only one person that can be blamed for this war, and that is Vladimir Putin and his regime. Uh, they are the ones who are killing innocent civilians and innocent soldiers as well. How much do you think, though, Vladimir Putin has the support of the Russian people? Impossible to say. I think at the beginning of the war, usually in Russia and elsewhere, actually, people rally around the flag. And it's quite comfortable to sit in Moscow and look at, you know, disinformation and propaganda TV programs saying how well the special operation in Ukraine is going. But then when there's circumscription and when there's mobilization and your son or you have to go into war, the situation gets a little bit too close for comfort. Uh, so I think the support for the war is going to continue to decline because it's doing very poorly. There are many reasons for it. The military is corrupt. It's incompetent. And they clearly don't seem to have the capacity to deal with the situation. So whatever the popularity ratings or approval ratings of the war are right now, expect them to go down as the winter approaches. On a scale of one to ten, how do you rate the chances of us going into a major European war? In other words, where NATO would be involved and we're essentially looking at what? A possible another world war? I'm not going to speculate on that, but I think it's very unlikely. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of people who don't understand what's going on and they're hyping up the situation. And I'll just give you one example. Elon Musk is all over the place uh, with his commentary about peace agreements, about World War Three, et cetera, et cetera. Now, fine, I'm all for free speech, but I, 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 I would like to see, you know, expert commentary a little bit more and from all the experts that I'm listening to, that I'm having discuss, discussions with, and also from my experience, perhaps in mediating uh, peace in, in, in the war in Georgia in 2008, I don't see World War III as being a likely outcome of this, nor do I see uh, a likely outcome in the full engagement of uh, NATO countries or the United States. Henry Kissinger, though, says that he thinks that Ukraine will have to cede territory for this to come to some kind of end? Well, I, of course, have a lot of uh, respect for uh, Henry Kissinger, uh, and I also respectfully disagree uh, with his thesis on this. It's very much from the John Mersheimer realist school of thinking, where you're kind of thinking that, OK, in order for you to survive, you have to give in to the rules and regulations uh, that have been set into the world order. You know, with that claim, you know, we could say that Russia can come into Finland and take some territory and we just lift up hands. The life is, life is a little bit more complicated than that. I'm still hopeful that uh, Ukraine will be able to push back, take the four annexed territories back, uh, including the Crimean Peninsula, uh, because the only thing that Putin understands uh, is power. And I think Putin needs uh, not only to lose this, but he needs to, at the end of the day, also understand that with a big defeat comes humiliation. And it was a, this is what really makes me mad is that 
This is a completely and utterly unnecessary war. It's all about Putin's ego and Putin's legacy. It should have never happened. Uh, but I hope, therefore, that he will be really utterly and fully defeated so that the rest of the world understands that the price of war is simply too high. Don't do it. Alexander Stubb, thank you very much for being on In Conversation. My pleasure. Thanks a lot.